Glenn to see you all here today. If anybody doesn't have the download installed yet, as I said, I've got them on USB drives here for all the platforms. It's more fun if I'll play along. Um, uh, we have two hours booked for this. This doesn't mean that we're necessarily going for two hours, but that meant to stay for two hours. We're just gonna, it's gonna be open-ended and we're gonna play and you just say until you add enough and uh, don't, don't worry, we just leave it in time. Don't with say three albums, why not? I, 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 somebody wants to drive you home. Are you got to be home? Because he drives me home, then we can stay as long as he likes us. Um, so the idea is to get, um, to just give you uh, an overview of GT and to give you a little bit of practice with old pool development. So the first thing to do is to download it. Uh, usually when you download, uh, so there are two ways of running GT. Uh, it's an open source platform for software and uh, data analysis. Uh, you can either download the pre-built image, but if you're really developing with it, you should build your own. So if you run one of these scripts and it will build it on your platform, that usually takes 10 minutes. So every day when I get up in the morning, I first start with my build and then I wash the shower and let my, my faff in and my build is ready for me to start 10 minutes later. Um, so it's always nice to be working with, uh, with the latest image. Okay, once you get that and you've downloaded, it might have been auto unzipped. You just open the thing up and as we, oh, I, uh, perhaps. Uh, so running it on each platform is slightly different. On uh, Mac, you just double click on the app. If you're running it from uh, the built image, it's better to run it from a terminal because then any errors that appear will appear in the terminal. And then if something goes sideways, you can say exactly what the error was. So that's important to know. But usually if you're just playing around, uh, clicking and opening it and running it is fine. It's slightly different. Is everybody able to, to, to start it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so for me, I'm just gonna start it up. It's gonna complain. Is everybody able to start it? Yeah, great. Uh, one other thing to know is that when you are working with GT, typically you'll be having your projects in Git repositories. Uh, and then it's better to work with a build, and then there's a process to tell it what your Git credentials are. So I'm not gonna do that for you today because that'll just waste time. We're just gonna play around, and if you wanna save what you have, you can file out your classes or your packages. Um, when you start it up, uh, it's not here, but it's probably on your image. At the top, there's a yellow bar saying, you want a tour. Uh, but we're not gonna do that. If you're by yourself, doing the tour is fine, but to do it now would be boring and waste time. If you're by yourself, it's, it's, there's lots of interesting things, but we're just gonna dive in and start playing with stuff because everything that's in the tour will encounter anyway, uh, and then it in a more focused way. Uh, but I just need to show you one or two things before we start. So when you open up here, you'll see these uh, cards here. There's only one here, but typically when you load in projects, like when I loaded my project, I have a starting card uh, and that's going to be a starting point for something. And it's usually for Lepidor database. So Lepidor database, like the Jupyter database, it's uh, uh, a database of pages. Uh, pages, each page is got a bunch of hex, a marked out hex, interspersed first with code snippets and other kinds of snippets. And it ends up being like a, essentially a wiki. So if you click on that thing, you'll find all sorts of documentation about the system. Uh, Oh, that's interesting. So this guy, um, let me see, scale the UI. So the, you can query the database and say, how do I scale the UI? And it, there's a page here with code snippets and I can do this and it'll scale the UI for me. So maybe 1.3 might be better for you to read. Is that better in the back? Okay. So I can scale the UI. So this is a, a, a essentially uh, like a wiki uh, of all sorts of, thank you, uh, a wiki of all sorts of information. So it's, it's a notebook. Um, we'll be using it, but what's cool, okay, there are a bunch of tools here. You have a toolbar on the left and you have a tool uh, toolbar up in the top right, more or less the same things, things you'd expect to find, like uh, a coder. And uh, in the coder, you'll find typical kind of uh, code views of, uh, uh, of software with methods and classes and all that stuff. Uh, if you saw my talk on Monday, though, 
you'll see that when you do multiple development, you tend not to start from a coder. What you try to do is you start from multiple objects. So you're actually working in the inspector much more often. We'll see that in a minute or so. There are a bunch of other tools here. We'll be working mainly with the, the first three to start with. There's also a Git tool, which we won't use today, um, uh, but I can show you offline if you're interested at some point. Code changes, like I guess everybody knows, if your Smalltalk image dies, you can replay your, your changes. That's that tool. There's a monitor for monitoring what's happening with processes and so on, file system. And you can even go to the morphic world if you uh, want to break out. So GT is built on top of Faro, 100%. But it has its own uh, graphical system based on block with native windows. So if you don't see, uh, if you think there's some, if you may think you've lost a window, then you may have to search around for it. So uh, you actually have real windows instead of windows inside, uh, um, virtual windows inside a single window. If you want to learn about GT, then a good place to start with is the book. You've got a tour of the environment, you've got case studies, you've got tutorials, and so on and so on and so on. Now, when you start programming, you're going to uh, be using the notebook. So if you click on a playground, then you get a place to play. So you can do things like this, say three plus four. So this is a playground typically starts with a code snippet. And um, then you get a whole bunch of buttons here. So for example, this button will just evaluate or do it. And as you can guess, that's not gonna be very interesting. This one will do it and inspect, which is a little bit more interesting. And then we get a small integer. Um, instead of the usual inspector view that we get, we also have some additional views which are built into GT. So we have a preview, we have an integer view, not very exciting, but we also have the meta view which shows us um, the, the class of the, 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 the coder view for, this, for the class of this object. You'll also notice here some funny little things. The little triangles are essentially code bubbles. So a little bit like live typing here, since we know in this code snippet what these objects are, we can resolve the plus. We know which plus it is, so we can open it. So whenever GT knows, it'll give you one of these code bubbles and let you open it. If it doesn't know, you have to just search for implementers. So that's kind of cool. And this goes on as far as you like, you know, you can continue opening code bubbles uh, wherever you are. Okay, so that's, uh, ah yes. So this is a playground. What's the difference between a playground and a note? Essentially none. A playground is an anonymous note that starts with a code snippet and a note is a named page that hello that starts with uh, a text snippet. So here we're going to say uh, uh, so small talks. Oh, and I'm dyslexic, so I keep I can always make make lots of typos today. GT workshop, and this is now a page, and it started with a text snippet. But if I want a code snippet, I can click on the plus and get a code snippet as well, and type three plus four here. And there are code uh, shortcuts for everything as well. So I tend to use the shortcuts that happen to be command G for go, but uh, uh, there are too many shortcuts for me to tell you about all of them. Now there's a little plus here. That's important. That plus gives you a view of your Lepidor database. So when you created those notes and those pages, what it did is um, for the very first time, it went into your documents folder on your hard drive and created a folder called Lepidor. So if you go there now, so if I go to my home directory into documents, there's a folder called Lepidor. And that's where all these files are. In fact, if you inspect a page, you can see where that file is. In, oops, I, did I click the wrong thing? I always forget which is the right guy. Uh, isn't this the inspect the files page? Yeah, so here is an inspector on that page and here's an inspector on the file storing the JSON contents of this page here. And the path is here. So it's actually a file locator. Whoa, hello. 
and this is where it is on the system. So what this means is all the pages that you create, when you shut down your image and throw it away and download another image the next day and start it up, your pages will still be there because they're not in the image, they're in your file system. So that means you have a permanent persistent Lepidor database which will persist across uh, your, your projects. Now if you create a project with GitHub or whatever where you're doing lots of coding, then it's good to put a Lepidor database there because you want these pages associated with your project. So these are my personal pages, and I've got uh, uh, a ton of them. Let's see here. Uh, so I have, for example, my to-dos, um, the things that I have to do as soon as possible, the things that I'm playing with, and uh, I also have uh, lots of uh, to-dos and uh, how-tos, and I even have them as tags. So all sorts of things that I learned how to do and I said, oh, I want to know exactly how to do that. So I actually have 806 unclassified pages here. When you open up your view, you won't see the TOC, you'll just see a pages list. But you can take a page that you've created and say, hey, make this the table of contents. And that's what I've done. So I just have a small page with a bunch of top level links and the rest are pages that will point to other pages. But I can also search for anything here. So if I search for small, oops, as I said, small talks, there are a bunch of named pages with small talks in them. And I can see which they are. And uh, so as you can see, it's, it's kind, of a, a kind of a wiki that's local to your, your projects. That's a very quick overview of some of the basic things that are there. Well, what we would like to do today is do uh, some exercises. Uh, so I have, uh, yeah, my multiple development exercises. So there's some pages in the book here. If you search for exercises, you'll find these pages here. And what I was gonna propose is that we try and do one of these. So these are pages in the GT book. Um, as I mentioned in the talk on um, on Monday, if you were here, I was talking about multiple development patterns. And typically you want to, uh, when you're starting, you might either be starting from a greenfield project or more likely you have existing uh, data. So I've got here uh, two kind of greenfield projects. I think the Sudoku one is going to be is going to be way too ambitious because we're only going to do baby steps today. Uh, implementing a moldable stack machine. Here the idea is that we implement uh, a little stack machine that can be used to simulate a, uh, a reverse Polish notation calculator. So it's a greenfield project. We don't have anything. We're going to build it from scratch. Then I have two projects that are pretty similar uh, and they're taking existing data. So I've got lots of, uh, I'm a big movie fan and I've got my catalog of all of the movies that I have in some form or another uh, on IMDb as a, as a list. But you know, you can export from IMDb and you'll get a CSV file, but you can load that into GT and start creating a little moldable application around that. And that's kind of fun to do. And it's similar to what you often would do in a real GT application. If you're working, uh, if you have a real project, you'll probably have existing data. So you might create some domain objects from scratch, but others might just be wrapping existing data that you have. Uh, exploring the publications database is also similar. Here we have um, a BibTeX file of all of our publications of my former research group. And there you can start taking all of that data and building domain objects for the publications and the venues and the authors and so on, and make that a, a, a browsable, explainable system uh, as well. And then the Sudoku thing, is something that I actually started playing with as well, but didn't get very far because it's really, uh, it's really a lot of work. So I wouldn't recommend that. But I would say one of these three. So my first question would be is, would people prefer something more greenfield or something which is taking existing data? So more greenfield, greenfield and working with existing data. Oh, now I'm going to have to count. Can somebody count for me? And I'm, can you, I don't know where we got. So greenfield, how many? And for wrapping existing data, working with existing Six? Okay, so we got one more for uh, wrapping existing data. 
So then for the existing data, uh, who would prefer, again, we'll have to, I'll need your help, Hernan. Who would prefer the IMDb uh, lists? And who would prefer a publications database? One, three, four, five. <laughs> so it's IMDb then. So close. Okay. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is we'll do the the IMDb one. You woo. Um, like to do. So what we're going to do? Let, let's. Uh, so. So what, how do you get here? Good question. So go to Glamorous Toolkit, open that up. Yeah. yeah, oh, please ask questions. Don't raise your hand and wait for me to see you. Just speak up because people are going to come up with lots of questions. And uh, I've got light shining in my eyes here, so I don't see the peripheral actions very much. Um, so I, w I would just search for it, say I'm DB. Oh, there it is. Okay, that, that's, that's the page with that in the title. By the way, what we're seeing here, these are moldable searches. So each of these searches here is an adaptation on the Lepidor database itself. And uh, you can find the code of this. Where is it? Like so? Ah, because we're not in an inspector context. But anyway, each of these... When you have a, an application in an inspector, we're not in an inspector here. Uh, when you perform it, uh, when you have a um, domain in which you have collections of things, sometimes you want to search for them. And all it is is a tiny little method with the GT search pragma. And it says uh, what kind of search you're supposed to perform and what you're going to return. Okay, so here we are in this page. What I would suggest you do is you copy that link and then create a new uh, note. Actually, I already had a note that I started to create, which was, uh, right, this was the, the workshop page here. I'm actually going to add a tag here, small talks. Oops, 2023. So that's another page, and it just links to all of the pages where I have that tag. So every page also has links to pages that link to it. So I can find all the pages that have the Smalltalks 2023 tag here. Um, I'm going to get rid of this, and I'm going to paste. Hello. This guy. So when we were on this page, if you click here, you'll copy a remote reference to the clipboard, and you'll put it on your page in your Lepidor database, and that'll, that'll point to the Glamorous tool, cool tit, Toolkit uh, book page. So now I'm editing the page on the left, which is in my database, but I can quickly access the, the other page and copy and paste stuff back and forth if I like. So how do you create the method? The thing is that they, they need whose work of something like you see, I, I missed that. How do you convert it? Okay, so um, all of this is just markdown. And mar uh, you, do you know, what, you know what markdown is? Yeah, yeah. So, but it's extended markdown. And to get a link to a page, I to type two left brackets and then the name of the page that I want. Now, this page doesn't exist, so it's in red. But if I click on it, it's created and now, and it's added to my database. Whereas if I type something else like uh, tonal parser page, uh, that's actually a link to something in the, uh, in the GT book. Uh, or if I link to fix markdown websites, that's going to be a link to uh, an existing page in my Lepidor database. So the two square brackets are one extension. Uh, the other usual thing is uh, this for links to uh, pages in uh, anywhere else that works. And the double curly braces are links to classes and pages and methods and so on. Well, I won't use it at the moment, uh, but there are lots of those. Also, there are different kinds of snippets, so there are tons of them. Uh, most of them we're not going to be interested in. See, there's even a gemstone, gemstone snippet here. Good, eh? Huh? Um, cool. 
So as everybody got here, they've got a page with a, a link to the um, IMDb movie list page. Yeah, everybody's, has somebody got a problem so far? I think we got to this one project you were some page. I lost a bit of... Oh, you created it. So you create it by clicking on note. You click on note. You give it a title, whichever one you like. Did he know what did he do about? Did I can see for you as a, a steel, so I love the it again. Don't know, that, that, but that's why I want everybody to, to keep up. So if somebody gets lost and falls behind, then you lose the whole trail. So don't be afraid to say, oh, uh, how do I do that? I don't see it, the screen. It's, uh, you want to sit closer? I know the same, but I have to make it and walk. But another day. Okay. Uh, is that okay now? Good. So now what I actually have, I, we could go to IMDb and I actually have a link here to my, um, uh, I, I do have a link to my list, but I'm not going to use. So actually, if I go to IMDb, and am I logged in here? Now I'd have to sign in. Uh, uh, right, but you've seen IMDb. Let's not do that. What I've actually done is I have downloaded, and it's in the image, a copy of the file. So I would say if you can create in your page a, a, fer Ooh. a Faro snippet, and then copy and paste the code from the right-hand side. Everybody get that far or? No. It's okay. Some people are still looking. Is everybody okay, or does somebody have? Uh, did somebody have some issue? It's okay. James, okay. Giorgio, Yoshiki, everybody, okay. So now we've got this snippet over here. Huh, that doesn't help. Uh, it's just gonna. Pretty print. So um, here we have the file locator. If we highlight just that, the file locator with this path. Actually, how did I get to there? If you just highlight this code or put it in yet another snippet, uh, to get another snippet of the same kind inside. So if I want to get another text snippet, I just hit return. If I want to get another code snippet, if I hit return, it just continues the same one. But if I hit command return or alt return, it'll give me a new one. And that way, that saves me from hit, typing the plus all the time. If I just say file locator gt resource and inspect that, uh, by the way, that's alt g or command g for go, then I'll see this uh, uh, this uh, resource uh, link here. And this will point me to all the downloaded um, repositories on uh, from Fink in the system. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to this through this path to get to this file, which is in the demos folder. And when I inspect that, I can see all the code. And it's a great big, oh yeah, it even complains because it doesn't like the, the length of the file. But that doesn't matter. Uh, and in that view. And then we can ask that file locator. This is just an object here. We can ask this file for its contents. Hello. And inspect that. And there we can see the actual string contents of this uh, IMDb list. Uh, and that's what we have here. So when we inspect the snippet, that's what we're going to get. Get rid of that. Okay, so that's pretty boring. We just have a string here. What we'd actually like to do is uh, is parse that. And 
if you search in the system, so there's a global search, which is Spotter, and uh, you might say, oh, is there a parser for CSV? So you can say CSV parser, and actually we saw something pretty fast. So it's searching through the whole system for Lepidor pages and classes and packages and methods and everything. And it found two classes here. So we can actually go there. And now we have a coder view of CSV parser. You say, ooh, okay, what is this? This seems to be a smack parser. Um, and it has some examples built in, but they're not probably not terribly useful. But we can look for references. Wait, so yes. I'm back on the subscript out of bounds, and I don't see it flows. Oh, it should be, uh, so let me do that myself here. So I inspected that, and up popped this guy. And then I closed it by clicking on the little red button. Oh, it's a window. It's a complete separate window. Okay, and I jump, if I minimize it, I build a free... Oh, so what? I don't see my window. It's it's not a native window in the sense of showing up in the window bus. Oh, it should be. But can you just kill it by closing it? You want? Do you really want to quit? Oh, well, wait a moment. Th that's going to quit. That sounds like you're quitting the. Oh, what you might have done is you might have closed the uh, the other guy. Fine. So I need a full screen. Oh, the full screen misbehaved. Uh, because if you put it full screen, then you have the full screen thing, and the window is going to be in a separate uh, screen, right? So that's what you got there. So I I only use full screen if I'm doing a, a slideshow or something. So I prefer to have all the windows in the same place. Did anybody else have a problem like that? So do you, do you still have the other? You're back. Okay, so we kill this, we're back. Good. Oh uh, yeah, so we found a CSV parser and here we found some references and we even found some, uh, eventually we start searching and say, oh, here's something that's cool, CSV to JSON. And after some sleuthing around, we can find, uh, it's already described here in the page describing the exercise, there is um, some code that we can that will leverage the CSV parser and uh, visit it and generate a JSON for us, and that'll be much nicer because we don't want the AST uh, and we don't want the text form. We would like something which is like a collection of dictionaries. So if we now copy this guy and create a new uh, a new snippet with this. Oh, by the way. Um, one thing I like to do is whenever I'm writing these pages, at least having some uh, short description of what the heck we're doing so I remember next time. So first, we need a, a download or an export of the IMDB list of my movies. Okay? And then, uh, yeah. I get another text step. So that's another keyboard shortcut command shift return will give me the the menu of uh, of snippets that I like. Uh, but it's the same as clicking plus and selecting then text. And we want to parse it and get a JSON. Good. So we'll try that. Now notice. Uh, here, this snippet is accessing the CSV variable because this wasn't declared as a temporary in ORBARS. The scope of the variables is the entire page. So here we can continue executing because CSV is bound. If, on the other hand, I open up a new copy of this page with this button here and try and evaluate this, then I'll get an error because CSV is not bound in this page, okay? because I didn't evaluate this this snippet here. So that's just to know. If you get an error, that meant that you uh, 
you probably are trying to access some variable which isn't hasn't been uh, bound yet. Have a question. Yes, so yes. there's a difference between the A and the means part of the page, but it's all right. Uh, yeah, so you have instances of uh, Lepidor pages. However, there's something a little bit weird. Um, if I have two instances of uh, this Lepidor page and open this in a new window here, and now if I evaluate, so this, you'll see this, they somehow stay in sync. So if I evaluate this guy, see the other one also updated. And that can be surprising and annoying sometimes. So they are separate instances in some sense, but they're also, they're twins. They're, they're the same page somehow. So yeah, so they're, they're the same page, but the, for the point of view of the context, the execution context, they have different uh, contexts. Yes. How do you write the set that we want to start the is from get your gene because they write it, uh, the stretch item and narrow the role. Oh. The, oh, the phrase I've been able to understand. Can you show me? Oh, see, I don't know. Okay, so did everybody get to this point? So now if we inspect this guy, we'll get um, another guy. Ah, yes, okay. I'll, I'll show you people. So suppose I'd created, I'd written this inside a code snippet. I get all these fixits because it's trying to park this as small talk code and says, and this, I don't know what and is. Is that a class? Would you like me to create it? So we could create that. And it says, well, and the and class doesn't have a message we, so do you want me to add one? And so on. So we could make this sentence into valid small talk, but we're not going to do that. So what you needed to do, that may be confusing, is you need to click the plus and get a text snippet rather than a code snippet. So, and and then you, and then it should look okay. And if there are way to change the title, you better not. No, no. You'll have to create a new snippet and copy and paste the bits and pieces. I mean, you could programmatically do it if you want to. There are all sorts of crazy things you can do programmatically, but you know that. <laughs> Okay, so now we have a different view. We can get the JSON string, the JSON path, JSON object, and so on. But you know, this isn't much better. Uh, there's also, what is it? I think JSON object is another one. And then instead of this JSON object thing, it ju I just get an array of dictionaries, which is yet another thing. So these are two things that we could have. So you might want to have both of those snippets around. Check. So this one gives us kind of a nice view. It's kind of fun, funky. Um, but we can't do much with this. We can ask this guy, by the way, uh, once we get one of these guys, we can inspect it. It's a CSV to JSON. And we can look and see what it supports. So there's a JSON and a JSON object method. And we see, okay, one is nicely formatted GT JSON entity, and the other one is the tree of dictionaries and arrays. So once we see that, we say, okay, this is actually, all this is, is just a little visitor which does some simple transformation. So once we see that, say, so okay, the, this guy is kind of pretty. It has a nice view that we might want to reuse later. But this is probably going to be more useful to us. Um, so what are we going to do next? Well, by the way, if you want to reorder these snippets, there's a keyboard shortcut. But down here, there's a little hamburger. And the hamburger can be used to move a snippet up or down or indent it or dedent it. Uh, but of course, there's a keyboard shortcut for that, which I'm going to use, which is just option shift down arrow. <laughs> But uh, yeah, indentation and moving snippets around is also, it's not the greatest. It's not drag and drop, unfortunately. But uh, um, Okay. So as I said, this is Markdown. So I have the, uh, the hash, so I have a header. 
So the next thing what we want to do is we want to have a moldable object. So let's think, first of all, what do we want? We have this, we have this CSV of movies. Every line is a movie. And um, this is actually the view that was more enlightening. Every movie has a title, a date that it's created and modified. There are directors. Uh, we have uh, a year somewhere and a rating. We have a URL and we have some genres. So clearly some of these are attributes and some of these are domain entities. We actually don't have a very rich CSV, but at least we have three different objects, right? Four. We have four objects at least. We have a collection of movies. We have a movie. We have a director. We have a genre. And that's about it, right? Did I miss something? And a lot of most of these things here are just going to be attributes of film. So film has a title, um, but a director is a separate thing. And we might want to navigate from a director to all of that uh, director's movies or perhaps other co-directors that uh, that person directed films with. So that means that what we actually want, this thing here is the data for a film collection. So. What we would do uh, is, um, actually I would write down what I just said to keep track of that. So I usually take sort of short form notes and after some time, if I actually want to document things, I can go through my notes and expand them and clean them up. But I just start with, we have uh, four domain objects, uh, film collection, and let's ignore the typos. I can always fix them up later. A movie, uh, a director, and a genre. We have four possible domain objects. Uh, we start with the first. So ignore my typos, because otherwise I'll spend all of my time fixing my, my uh, never-ending typos. So here, the thing that we're going to do is the following. And this is kind of a pattern. So the patterns are in the book. So if you search for pattern, you'll find multiple development patterns. And there are pages describing the patterns. You can also search for multiple uh, development patterns slideshow, which is the slideshow that I showed you. Here I'm in the coder view, but if I click on this button, since it's a slideshow, I'll get an inspector view of the slideshow and I can see the slide deck with all my annotations. And I can also click on the play slideshow button, which will actually start up the slideshow so you can walk through it. And this time the, uh, uh, so that's where that is. This is where the patterns are and where we are now, we've actually started the project diary. We created a page. We were starting to document what we're doing. So this is, this is really fundamental. So this is actually the real starting point. But the most important starting point is that we want to get a moldable object. And in this particular case, since we have existing data, we're going to get that moldable object by wrapping some data. That'll give us a moldable object where we can now play and explore it. Eventually, we might create some example objects. And then we'll want to create some views for these guys and eventually some actions. So that's basically the pattern. And, oh, and uh, where's this viewable data wrapper? Here's some examples as well. So this is also live. This is going to be a different example uh, in here. But the pattern is basically this. You're going to create a new kind of object representing a, a class representing your initial domain object. You create a new instance of it and stuff in the data. Um, Tudor likes to call it raw data. I like to call it just data. It's a question of whatever you like. So I'm going to say film collection. Small talk is less uh, tolerant of my typos, so I have to make sure. Film collection new. And data is, um, I want to get this guy, CSV data. There's my CSV data, and I'm going to take the CSV data and plug it in here. 
So this is what I want to create my first domain object. Notice I'm not going to the coder. What you would typically do is either you would immediately create a class somewhere in the coder and then start programming there, or you might create a test class first and do it in a test-driven way. But it's going to be a while before you get to an actual object. We turn that around, we create an object first, and then start coding from there. When we have an example that we like, then we'll factor that out and then add our tests in there. So it's a slightly different process because we want to get to a moldable object as fast as possible. Is this we did that piece there sort of then being the Jason method of doing here? That Jason object, was that right? Yeah, Jason, uh, Jason object is what we want to send. So this is what we want because we want the, the raw arrays of dictionaries. This one is also a nice object and we could work with that, but you know, a, I want the raw data to be as simple as possible, and arrays of dictionaries is good. But it could be whatever you like. I, I just chose. I like arrays of dictionaries. They're easy, uh, easy to understand. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I think we'll get pretty fast to the poor point where we're going to create a couple of views and a couple of domain objects, and we'll start to have something explorable. And it's as, as, as a small example, so it won't take too long, but I expect within uh, 15, 20 minutes or maybe half an hour, we'll have a few things to, to, to look at. It's going a little bit slower, of course, because I'm explaining things as we go, but the initial steps actually go pretty fast because they're almost always the same. So we're going to create a class. We'll use the fix it. Of course, we could create the class in the code or anywhere else, but this is super convenient. The only thing you have to do is uh, add the package name. So we'll call it uh, movies uh, demo. You can call it whatever you like. And because this is a domain object, I'll make the sub package or the tag model to distinguish it from parser or examples or tests or whatever thing. So you don't need to have the tag, but it's I, I like to have it there. And then we just accept that. So now we have our film collection class, we can actually open the code bubble and see its definition. There it is. Or we could open that in the coder here by pressing this button. And there's the coder view. Or I can option click that and, oh, sorry, command click. And now I get a traditional coder view of that class. But we're not going to do that. Yes. Well, okay, I just was creating a class. Yeah. Did you get to create the class? And I think that I just run slap dot after. Okay, undo. Okay, let me delete it and roll back a bit. My Okay, so we were here. We had the fix it. So I just deleted this guy. Let me just get this out of the way. Now the film collection class does not exist. You collect. Select Create Film Collection. You add at least a package name, Movie Demo. And I like Model here. And then what you have to do is scroll down and click this check mark. Yeah, I, I went a bit too fast over that. I'm sorry about that. And that'll commit. And now it exists. And now if we do Apple B or something, we can open a browser on it even. But it's not terribly important. It that, that was the bet, so just I did and then didn't. But you, you just put the mouse in it and do Command B or Apple B or whatever it is. and uh, Or you can open the code bubble and even do an option click on the book thing here and that will open the browser view. And that will create a new one. Uh, the code bubble is always the uh, little gray triangle to the right of a method or of any name. This is very faint gray thing here. Yeah, you can't see it on the screen there. It's too faint. But it's right next to film collection on the right. So every when I click that, it just gives me back. Oh, no, it does typically back. I think about it. Okay, excellent. Everybody got there? Ooh, my mouse is not... Let me just make this a bit bigger. We still can't execute this. It's uh, not implemented here. So again, this is a little bit like the live typing. <laughs> it knows that the data message is a message of an instance of film collection. So 
It knows it should be implemented. So we're going to implement it. Oh, I normally wouldn't have had that open, uh, but would just get the code bubble here. And what we're going to do is we're going to make it a slot. So we'll say data colon equals on op command shift F is going to pretty print that. Okay. So we're going to initialize data or raw data if you're a tutor or prefer the raw data name. Now this doesn't exist, so we'll have to fix that. And we're not going to make it a temporary, but we'll make it a slot. Right, so an instance variable. In, in Faro, it's going to be a slot, though. So first class object instead of an instance variable. And now our code is good. We've created our first domain object. Now we can go and inspect it. And there it is. There we have our data inside. So we now we have the poorest inspector view of our new domain object, which is the, the standard inspector view. It's only showing us the raw data. We get for free a print view, which doesn't do anything terribly interesting. And we get the meta view. The difference between this view and this view is what self is. Self here is bound to the object, and self here is bound to the class, because here we're in the coder. Here we don't have an instance anymore. When I click this, this gives me a, a, an ordinary browser view. Here I'm in the context of the object. So if here if I say self class, that's going to be a film collection class. And if I say self class, uh, class here, it should be meta class. All right. Okay. Good so far? Everybody got to here? Okay, cool. Now, remember this data. Uh, uh, I'm have a little bit of trouble working with this mouse, but it's still better than the trackpad. I, I prefer working out for some reason I'm uh, sticking on things. Yes, sir. There, I did see that it says a bit of documents that the deputy folk so does that also talk to him, or is that something like just the for you that only did some buttons that first? Uh, you're right. Actually, these are Lepter pages, and when we go here and see all the pages, there are some things that are just called playground, but I'm not sure where that one is stored because I think it's um, I'm 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 not really certain. So I think by accident it it actually is. Uh oh, where were we? Oh yeah, I should just minimize that. Yes, and you can move these guys around almost always. So if I click here, I could move this page to the Glamour Toolkit book. Or what I could have done with this page that we started with, you could have moved it from the Glamour Toolkit book to your database. And of course, since you're not committing the changes to the book, you're going to get a copy of that page, which is cool. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this, of course, is a playground, which is a contextual playground. I should actually keep that page open, which is the patterns, so that we can see where we are. So we got our moldable object. Now we're in the contextual playground. And this contextual playground gives us access to all of the data of that object. Yes. Ah, yes. It, I'm sorry, but if you're not... Playing with the real live system, you can't see this here. There's a there's a, a handle there. It's not it's not visible on the screen, but I can see it here. So you, you yeah, there's some things which are just the 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 contrast is not high enough on the screen. So th that that actually was something that people have complained about. It was even harder to see in the past, and now there's actually a visible handle. Because whenever people say, well, how do you do that? So there's a handle there. What a handle? I don't see it. Oh, there's a handle. Wow, amazing. I learned so much today. <laughs> there are all sorts of things like that. Do you have a similar handle on the left when you... Yes. And it's new? Uh, sorry? Under Let's Wrap It. 
through their skull. Ah, here I indented this so that it could close that up. But there's no further handle here. There shouldn't be one for the page. However, because this is not an inspector. If I click this guy, however, now I'm inspecting the small talk, this Lepiter page, and now I do have a handle because I can talk to the instance of the page. And I can say, what's my class? And I see I'm an instance of a LePage class. Okay, I thought there was something on the lab where you add an instance of no class each. <laughs> A maybe not a stick up for sure again. Okay, if it comes to you, we'll we'll look at it again. Uh, where were we? Right, so we've got this guy now. Okay, so this is a pretty boring view, but as we recall, we had our data, and as I recall, there's an as JSON, and we can get this JSON object back, and that was kind of a cool view. It it's, could be something that we might want to reuse. The JSON string is kind of boring. Well, we might want to reuse that too, maybe not. But, like, this is already a better view than this, right? So, why not? Let's just steal it. So, how do you steal it? You create a view, and it's just a forward view. It says, okay, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to ask, I'm going to delegate it to another object. So the first thing you have to find out, well, what's the object? The object is data is JSON. And the view, you can option click on the on the header of any view to see the code. Now can everybody do that? Usually when you option click, you get something that looks like this with one parameter. This one is a little funny because it has an extra um an extra argument, but don't, which is the context, but let's not worry about that. If you want to copy a method name, there's a little um, button at the bottom of each method, and that's super useful uh, when you want to make references to methods or, or examples or whatever. So we can just copy that guy. Now, what are we going to do? We have the meta view, um, the raw view. I'm going to open up a second inspector on the same object so that I can see two different views of the same guy at the same time. Everybody there? It's just this little eye here. Oh, okay, sorry. Let's go back here. I did to J data is JSON. I said, I like this view. I option clicked there to get the source code. Listen, did you know that that's not what he does? No. Yes. Really? Does anybody know the answer to that? There should be some some simple meta click. It's not working. I'm I'm sorry, but okay. But we, we, it, it's not critical. We can manage even if we don't do that. But I I just copied that method name. But we'll we can also just type it in. So let me get a second view of this guy. Go to the meta view here. And I'm going to add here, in the coder view, I'm going to add a method. And what should we call it? Well, we want a JSON view of the data. So I'll call it GT JSON for a view. So I'm clicked on the add, and I have this contextual menu. And I'm just starting to type in there. So the convention is, whatever thing that you're viewing, it's going to be GT name of view for a view, whatever it is. It's almost always like that. Then there has to be a pragma GT view that says this method is a view. That's what really says. The name is irrelevant. The name could be anything. It's just by convention we call it GT something for uh, because it's, it's easy to remember. And we usually give it a category instead of accessing, we give it a category of view. I'm just ignoring that mostly for, for now. And now, oh, I just clicked on the category here. So we have uh, the access in instance. Yes, you click on accessing, that's the category. And then you can edit it. Yep. 
and the instance thing is to switch between instance and class methods. Uh, we haven't actually saved this yet, but you have the same interface when the method is saved. And now what you do is you say a view, a view, no, a view. So now we, now we have an API for views, and we say what kind of a view we want, and there are about a dozen of them. And what we want is a forwarding view. You say, hey, view, we want you to delegate to another view. So what's the object? We have to say what object it is, and it's this guy, data as JSON. Oops, data as JSON. And what's the view? It does the set of block, the annotation. Yeah, yeah, that's the block in square brackets. Uh, and then what we want is this guy. So you have to type hash gt json object for colon context colon if you didn't weren't able to copy and paste it. So everybody should be able to type in that code. Thank you. Oh. Well, it doesn't matter. Just type without carriage returns, and they're pretty printed afterwards. <laughs> That's very strange. The carriage returns are irrelevant anyway. If they're not inside strings. Everybody got this far? Now, if you save this, Presto, the new view appears here on the live object. Yeah, and now we've got the thing saved. We can pretty print it with Apple Shift S that will reformat it a bit. We don't like the title. The title is terrible. We should change the title to JSON. And we want it to be the first view. So let's give it a priority of 10, let's say, and pretty print that. And now if we save that, it moves to the beginning. Now it's the first view and it has a nice title and so on. This is just to get quickly a cheap view in for our, uh, for, our opt for our film collection. But later on, we'll want to see other views. We'd like to see the list of directors or we'd like to have a view by years or, or other kinds of views. Did everybody get this far? Okay, cool. Um, right. So there are lots of things that we could do next. Does anybody have a preference? You'd like to see the list of films in a in a nicer way, perhaps. Yeah, it lets the movie see you nice and bit. Oh, very good idea. Thank you for that suggestion. So I mean, again, what we would do is we'd start playing. And if we just look at the data, we get a list of things. And each of these is a film, but it's just a dictionary thingy. So that means we're missing a domain object. So what we would actually like to do is wrap these guys up, every single one of these. So uh, uh, we could take data first and inspect that guy. There's one of them. And um, what we would actually like to do is say, for example, collect each, and then we'd like to make a movie out of each of these. So that becomes a moldable object too, or film. Film new. And what comes next? Data each. We apply exactly the same pattern. Now we're back, to, we're doing the same thing we did before. We create a class film in our movie demo. Is it movie demo or movies demo? Because <laughs> it changed. Yeah, it's movie demo. And it's another model class. And we'll save that. And then we'll do this as well. 
and it's not an each, but it's a a c s. No, it's a a, a dictionary. Cal. Yep. We are here to fill collection with the chase on you. Yeah, I'm inside a playground. When I have access to the data, that's a local slot of this object, the film collection, and I want to send the message to the data. I want to collect and create a new film object for every instance of data. And the data, as we recall, is uh, it's an array of dictionaries. Okay. How did you get to the inspector that's on the left? Gotcha. Uh, from here. So I started from the project page. I did film collection new data CSV data. Then I lifted up and I said, oh, I'm interested in the data, having a look at that. And I say, oh, I want to create a film object for each of those. Okay, so it did it. I'm just a good in uh, the one of the one out so or data refers to the entire collection data just returns refers to the slot of this object here so if i look, go to the raw view we see there's a slot there and there it is and it's a terrible view we want to get a better view of that guy by wrapping each of these guys as a film object And we'll make a slot there and save that. And now, if we evaluate this, instead of a list of dictionaries, we get a list of films. However, this code is just sitting in the playground. What we'd actually like is we'd like to have a films method. So what we can do is we can extract this as a method. So called films. That's a refactoring. So we can explore the refactoring before running it and see what it actually is. But I'm just going to do it. And now uh, we can etch if we inspect, if we browse the class, we can see there's now a films method. If we evaluate that, we'll get the list of films. And again, this is a pretty crappy name. We want a better name. So we're going to hack this guy and give him a... First thing we're going to have to do is I'd like to get the title out. But how do I get the title? And instead of writing some code and seeing if it works, let's just start exploring. Oh, here's a data. A data is a dictionary. And there's the title. So it should be data at title. Should be it. Looks good. So let's extract that as a method and call it self-titled. If I could only type. And let's create a print-on method, right? So this is this is not very good. So let's say print on, and the category should be printing and so on. A stream, what is it? I can never remember a stream next to put all blah, 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 self title, something like that. And this doesn't update automatically because we don't have any announcers. You can set that up. Uh, so if you really have things which are updating and you want the views to live update that you can do that very nicely. Uh, but now I have to, oh yes. And I made a mistake. Ah, oh, next put all. Thank you. I think that was it, huh? And every word we forward you. Hey. <laughs> and now if we update this guy, it's already quite a bit better. And we say, hey, that's the kind of view that we'd like to have over here. But we'll probably want other columns. So we could create a forwarding view to this, but then, then we can't change the view. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to steal the code so that we can later add more columns. So once again, we can option click to see what it is. And it's, well, it's called GT items for, duh. Uh, what's the object? The object is self films. 
So uh, let's create a new instance here with a meta view. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Uh, here, I want this guy. Uh, hmm? We had the gtjson4. Uh, in, instead of writing it here, since I already have a view, I'm just going to edit this guy. And this is going to create a new method, right? I'm not modifying this method because I give it a new name. So what should we call it? Films, films for, we can always change it. Um, but, oh, I made a mistake. I actually wanted to copy the, the code, right? So there's the source definition. I'm going to copy that code this time. And now, oh, again, I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. So now what I want is I want to create a new method. I'll do it here. <laughs> Cheat. And it's not going to be GT items for, it's going to be GT films for. And the object is not self, but it's self uh, films. And everything else I'll just leave as it is, right? Except maybe the priority. I want the priority of this guy to be 20. And I'll save that. And bang, there's the view. And we got it. So the code I got, I went to self films. And I looked at this list. And I say, hey, that's a nice view. That's a good starting point for the view that I want. Then I did option click to find out where the code is, where it's implemented. It's implemented in sequenceable collection, and it's called sequenceable collection GT items for. That's an extension method. So the sequenceable collection comes from Faro 10, and we've added an extension to it so that it becomes moldable inside Faro, inside GT. And I just copied that code and changed it slightly. I changed the name and I changed the title and I change the items. So now I have a slightly different method uh, because I didn't want a forwarding view. The reason is I'll, I'll add more columns later. So now we've seen two views, the forwarding view and a column list view. So it might be good to look at how it's defined. You have a title and priorities we had before. These are the items. Um, no, not those. Uh, items. Film collection. Uh, I should call this films. Yeah, films. I have the title films. The priority is 20. Maybe I want to switch these. So I'd like to have this as 20 and this one as 10. So it comes first. So that's a more interesting view, probably. The JSON view is okay, but kind of boring. The items are the films. So every item in the list is a film. And then for every item, I'm going to have uh, an index. So this number that appears here, one up to the end, and that's kind of standard. And then the second column. So there's always a column and some text and optionally some width. And here, in this case, it's going to be each item print string or GT displays. I could have said print string as well. That probably would have worked. And if I update that. And now when I click on one of these guys, I go to a film. That's a film object. It's no longer a dictionary because it's a wrap thing. And now I can play the same game here. I can say, okay, well, what is a film? What is interesting to capture about it? And this guy is a dictionary. And what are the items? And okay, we got directors and so on. Oh, the directors might be cool to have over here. So I'd like to see in this list, not just the title, Oh, uh, this is actually ugly too. Instead of item, it should be uh, the uh, title, right? I forgot to fix that. So it's the title of the movie. So maybe I want a column that says a column for year and a column for director. Don't want to put all of the data because then I get then I'm just replicating a, a spreadsheet. But some minimal information I like here, and then you can dive in to the domain objects afterwards to get more. Uh, so then I would play the same game as before. I would say, well, here's a film. 
And how do I access, how do I find the director? It's probably the same as the self-title. Uh, data at, uh, now actually this is going to get uh, slightly interesting. So if we say director, uh, di yes, data at director, and we'll get an error there because we weren't paying attention. If you pay attention, then you see it's not director, but it's directors. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Then, because it might have more than one director. Uh, and that works. Good. Well, let's extract that as directors. Directors. And that looks fine. And now we can say, oh, well, now let's see the directors here as well. So let's go and add a new... Uh, column here, and directors, oh, instead of each item print string, it should be each item title, that would be even better, directors, and bang. Yep. And how we did it, we got there being something wrong in that use, because I was just doing the bullets key as made a mistake, and I didn't realize what was happening before. I had no errors or worries. I just didn't see any time. You mean like this? Then you get a completely broken view. I didn't even get a top in the beginning. Oh. So I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to see it. You used some of your rest. Yeah. What is after that something in the card? Uh-huh. Well, I mean, there's no magic. There's, we go back to our old debugging practices. So, yeah, you, usually you want to start with a small and simple view. So that's another, that's another pattern here, which is simple view. So you want to start with a very simple view and slowly expand it, rather than starting immediately from something complex. So that's why I stole some code rather than writing it by hand, and then it could start to, to modify it. But even there, you can make mistakes. And now you, if you start browsing, you'll see that some movies have more than one director. They say, oh, well, if we want director to be a domain concept, and some of them seem to have no director at all, so we're going to have to, for each director in the directors, we're going to have to extract individual directors, however many there are for a film, and create a director object for each of them. And we're going to continue doing the same thing and adding more views here, and eventually, we'd like to go backwards. So, like from a, a from a film, we want to uh, from a film, we want to go to the directors. From each of the directors, we like to go to that director's films. But where are we going to get that from? That suggests that every one of these domain objects should know the film collection, so we could query the film collection or something like that. So then we would continue to do a process like that. But as we start answering questions. We play within the playground, we experiment, we see something we like, we extract it as a method, we say, oh, we'd like to see this here. We add a view or we extend a view, and uh, slowly we get a, a bunch of inter interconnected domain objects with associated views which allow us to navigate back and forth between them. Eventually, uh, maybe if I can show you this just very quickly, uh, demo markdown website. No, this is the wrong one again. The examples one is the one I want. So this was the website example that I'd wanted to show on Tuesday, but wasn't working. So here I have a view of a website with all the pages in it. Uh, and so here I have additional, I can see the contents of the web page. I can see the markdown of the web page. I have a, a custom action, which will open that page in a web browser. Uh, that's actually pretty simple. I can look at the code of that, and all it's doing is it opens a web browser on the URL, which is inside that object. So it's, there's no magic there. So I have views. I have uh, most of the views are column list views or forwarding views. Uh, I have a list of reachable pages here and a list of unreachable pages. I also have a map view. So this is a more complicated view. This is a Mondrian view 
where uh, this is also live, of course, and I can click on any of these and see which the page is. So this is the root page. This is another menu page, uh, publications in this case, and those are pages that are reachable from that guy. But it can also go from the original website to the, to the map of the whole website, showing some pages that are unreachable. Uh, and this was built exactly the same way what we were doing in the last uh, hour and a half, uh, just going step by step. Here's another cool thing, which is uh, these are pages for which I don't have any HTTP status. So I'd like to know, well, what are these? So I can actually check and ping these pages. So now it's live checking the connections uh, to these pages and reporting on what the, uh, what the actual status is. And I can actually stop that as well. And I can say, well, what is this problem? Name, lookup, error. Let's open that web page and see what happens. And can't find the server. So, okay, so I've got some dead, dead links in my website. So uh, what else can I do? This we didn't see yet, which is the searches. So the searches are exactly the same. Instead of GT view, it's a GT, oh no, that was the action. Uh, right, what I want is this. The option click on linked names. So to search for linked names is a GT search method. It looks pretty much like the, uh, like the views, but it's a slightly different API. And here I'm going to say not only what do I search for, uh, what do I search in, and how do I search for it, filter by substring, but I also want to say if I click on the result, what do I get back? So should I get back the actual object there, which might be a collection, or I'm going to wrap it up as a wrapped collection? So here, for example, I can search for small talk in, um, in this website. Oh, that's the web link group. I want it to be here. So if I search for small talk, small talk, here I've got pages whose names match small talk. That's one search, GT search. Here are pages whose content match small talk. And here are links whose names include dirt small talk. And I can search for all of those, go to a particular one, one particular uh, page or whatever, or I can go to the, uh, go to the group. And now I have a view of that, uh, that group of interesting pages and I can, I can browse them. The, the point is this is a more elaborate example, but what we were starting with with the IMDB example, just doing what we were doing up until now uh, in, uh, in a short period of time, an hour or two hours or whatever, you can build up a pretty complete domain model which you can then start exploring and answering questions about. And then if you get more and more interesting questions, you would just extend it with uh, more views and more actions. So essentially, the three ways of molding that we've seen that are uh, the most important to start with, first is the views. Second is having actions, like opening a browser or something. And the third is searches. Then there are all sorts of other ways the system can be molded. For example, the debugger itself is moldable. I've, I've never played with that. Uh, but it's something that you could do. You can also mold um, the, um, here it is, uh, Markdown website. No, it's the wrong one. Um, moldable development pattern slideshow. It's like this guy, this is a coder view, and it has extra buttons. That's also molding the coder, but in pretty much the same way. So I have a, uh, not only a GT action, which is understood but molding the inspector, but I'm also molding the coder at the same time. So the same button is going to appear in either tool. So there are lots of tools which are, are moldable in that way. So, this, so on the one hand, you're molding the GT environment itself, so it understands your objects, and on the other hand, you're molding your domain objects so that they, uh, they get augmented with all sorts of little tools. So each tool, the idea is, should be very, very small, very simple, something that you can implement in a few minutes like this. Some are more complex and require some additional work, like if you have to build a parser, then, uh, then that's, uh, that might require some more effort. But the idea is that most things you should be able to do quite quickly. Okay, um, I think I covered most of what I wanted to show you, and we were able to get to some point 
with the IMDb example. And as you can imagine, doing more would be more of the same. So I, I think what would be more fun now is if you have some specific questions or, well, how would I do this? Or how would, I, uh, or show me more of that, then, then I can uh, show you some other things. If you like. so, yeah, my question is not uh, really concrete on how to do this or how you do that, but I, I have a hard time connecting how to create a, a big application with this way of thinking with this way of, you know, attacking the problem and so on. And so... Uh, GT itself has been built yeah, using exactly I, I the same technology, and it's a big application. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, my question is to you and to your experience, uh, do you feel, uh, have you done that? And if so, did you feel that it was better uh, or not? Or you know, that's that's my problem. The first time I saw it, when Tudor showed it to me, that, that was my problem at that time and still my problem now. It's a paradigm shift, but uh, I don't know what can you say about it. Well, I mean, either you're starting from a new project from scratch, or maybe you have an existing project and you want to make it moldable. So you can either build something from the beginning or take an existing project in Faro, load it into GT and start augmenting making the domain objects explicit and making them explorable so you can start to answer questions that you couldn't before. In effect, that's what we've done with a lot of the Faro core classes. So now if I go to a, a, a file locator view, I can see, oh, and oh, even better, I can inspect, I think this is the, a fun one because, hello, compiled methods, they are heavily molded. So here's a compiled method I can see the source code, the properties, local versions, compiled blocks. Um, this is fun, a syntax explanation. Oh, why is it doing me that? Oh, oh, oh God. Demo effect. Uh, sorry. Syntax three, explanation. The three is the AST? Hmm? Three, the view three. There is an AST somewhere. I think that yeah. should be it. Mm, yeah. Okay. So all of these things are, are accessible as views. A compiled method is, I think, is the I did an analysis of the probably the the class that has been most heavily extended with views in the system. But what do you give to the final user? I mean, that's cool for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do we create the model objects and you know, and what do we provide to the final user if we want to create an application for a final user? You know, uh, I didn't know that. Targeted audience. Developers? Not only. No, because what we want to do, uh, so we're working with a new customer now. Uh, we have uh, basically our, our connection is uh, a, a unit which is providing AI services to other business units. And you say, well, we want to get started. So we get a pilot project, a couple of pilot projects with business units. They're very leery. Say, so what are they going to do? heard about too many silver bullets. So we say, okay, give us some of your data. Tell us what you're trying to do. What are your problems? We spend a few weeks or a month building up an initial, we tool up so that we can actually do something with the data. Maybe we have to write some parsers or some other tools. Then we build the, the domain model uh, as an explorable, moldable uh, application, just like this with all sorts of views. And then we can get to the point that we can sit together with the customer, so in that case, the business unit, say, okay, you have problems with this. So let, let us show you here. Is this something that's useful to you? And then they start to see what's possible. And then they say, oh, can you do this? They say, oh, and sometimes we can say, oh, it's there already. Or say, oh, just give me two minutes. Or they say, oh, yeah, we could do that in, um, yeah, give us an hour or something. And then they start to get interested. So we're having conversations, not at the level of the code. So you have, once you have a moldable, explainable system, then you have people who are doing the, um, the molding, and then you have people you have discussions with who need not be developers. So very often we have conversation at the, at the level of the business. Then it gets very interesting because you can start to expose things about the system, the knowledge in the system that's, that's implicit, that's buried in the code, but it's there somewhere. What would it take to add a film to the collection? I've been handed the microphone, so I'm going to repeat myself. 
that's all doable. It's just a, a simple matter of programming. But you have to have the right conceptual model. What does it mean to add a film to a collection? What are we actually updating? And where is that film collection? Now the film collection is sitting on IMDb. Do you want to update the IMDb list? Or do you want to have a, a local uh, repository and a file or a database or something? We haven't answered that question. Well, I want a window with labels, text fields, drop-down lists, and a save button. Yeah, sure, we can do that, but where is it going to be saved? Local. Yeah. Early L. I'm just trying to think if there's an example I can show you immediately. Uh, one doesn't immediately spring to mind, but yeah, all the, all of that is doable. There are all the widgets that you need for for in for having in the collection. Here we could have a button that says edit, and then we could just click. Actually, we've I've had that in. A, uh, so okay, here's the example, um, but I can't demo it to you because I don't uh, I can't load it immediately. So I'm working with a PhD student uh, at the University of Bern, uh, who's a student of my successor there, and he's analyzing GitHub Actions. And particularly, he wants to know when in uh, GitHub Actions there are errors in the specifications of the YAML files, and then you get so-called sticky commits so that they start thrashing and fixing this and fiddling with that. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to in the data analysis, do the um, what, what's the word, the labeling? So he, he wants to look at the list of sticky commits and browse to it and say, "Ah, oh, yeah, this is a sticky commit. No, that's not. It's one of these." So he wants to categorize them. So he wants in the interface, he wants to be able to select and either select an existing label or perhaps add a new label. That's exactly uh, that kind of thing. So you're editing the list, uh, the data that you have and adding, augmenting it with additional information. And then of course that's stored somewhere. So here you'd have uh, another, instead of just a plain text thing here, you would have another kind of a widget, which if you double clicked on it, you could edit it, or you might have a button or a drop down or whatever. That's all doable. Is that getting to what you were I mean, thinking about Hernan? Here, if you want to see what kind of an interface that you might have, Oh, uh, oh, right. I'm not. I'm in the download image, so I don't have any Git repositories loaded. So, uh, but you know, if you want to, you get all sorts of uh, widgets here. So, if I want to add a Git repository, I can clone a remote repository and add the text widgets in here, and and you can have simple kinds of drop downs or editable widgets or whatever you like. You mentioned this is using native uh, code or native widgets. Yeah, native windows. I mean, so it's not morphic, it's a different platform. Is it the entire window that's native and then you're just drawing in it? Or are you actually using different OS GUI elements in each? I have no idea. I was not responsible. I was not involved in the... Uh, Tudor showed that like two or three issues ago, uh, but I don't remember the answer. <laughs> I know, I know, it's, it's, but, but you know, um, a native implementation of something, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, they're doing it all by themselves. Uh, hi. Um, I have uh, maybe a comment uh, regarding what Hernan said. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I, I I'll say that I like the the tool uh, a lot the tools and the way you're able to like quickly visualize stuff and navigate between uh, all of the different parts of the system. I think those tools are like seem to be very useful. Um, I think thinking about what Hernan said, um, sometimes what I imagine that could happen is that as the the develop the, the flow you follow while you all you are developing is very based on like um i don't know trial and error fidgeting with the data and so on you um may end up with a, a design that is very brittle for example you um now you have your domain objects coupled with the structure of the json uh instead of having for example a separate object 
which um, creates, right, based on the JSON, creates a domain object, uh, but without the domain object knowing all of the JSON structure. And um, so by following the flow without thinking about other stuff, you end up with that coupling, which is not, doesn't look right in, in for, for a solid design, right? So I know that you can also use all of those tools uh, and design the system right. But um, like the, the workflow, maybe the workflow does provide some in incentives to go against good design. So be, that's a question, right? But I think um, that was what, maybe that was what Enron was trying to ask. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in terms of the process, I, I think what I didn't show you at all is how, uh, how we, uh, do testing. So this is this, uh, this other pattern, which is example object. So we, uh, all of our tests are examples. So that means, uh, a, a test is, uh, like a, a unit test, but it also returns an object and that object can be used for all sorts of other things. It's, it demonstrates something, it can be used in documentation, it can be used as a setup for another test, and so on and so on. And what I didn't do is you would actually do much more rigorous uh, creation of examples for all of the functionality that you want as you're going along. But I wanted to save time and focus on the, on the molding. Uh, but that's, it's, it, it's an essential component. Um, and just to show you quickly, so uh, GT example, GT pragmas. So this, we have a very nice querying system in uh, in um, GT. So this is showing us the all of the examples that are in the system, and it's lazily computed. So in order to make the whole thing scalable, that's we're working always with streams. And here you see there are thousands and thousands of, of uh, example methods in the system, and most of them are actually quite short. The, the idea of each of these guys is uh, basically every one of these guys looks like a test. It's just as a GT example pragma. It returns something, and it's got a bunch of assertions, just like a test. So the only thing that's really different technically is this, but that one small change has a huge impact on how you work with uh, with tests and what you can do with uh, tests afterwards. So every example can be used in in documentation, as I said, as well as setups for other tests. Um, yeah, so here's a cool thing to see. In this particular class, uh, I see the map of the examples, and this is another Mondrian view, but you can see that there's one test one example here, which is being reused. Yeah, uh, you can't see the arrows. So it's being reused uh, as um, uh, in um, in other tests. You get a test runner as well there. All examples run. Let's see that guy. No, they're getting errors for some reason. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Although you didn't show um, like examples of tests and examples, right, with assertions, mm -hmm. uh, you did mention that the workflow was first you start by working with an object, a concrete, concrete object. Then um, you eventually write an example and then you like write some code that's an example and extract it uh, to create an, an example in the system and then you can add the assertions, right? Yes. yes. So, um, what I'm saying is that by following that uh, flow of work, uh, you are driven by the like the the input data that you have. For example, the, the JSON uh, structure that that you um, begin with, and then the examples come from that. But mm -hmm. following a different workflow, for example, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I would say it's not driven by the data. The data is there. It's driven by the questions you ask. So you have a domain object, and it's supposed to tell you things. So uh, how do you answer those? I mean, well, you can write a test and say, okay, I want the director of this film to be that, and it's going to take some programming before I get that answer. I do it the other way around and say, well, how would I find the director? Well, let's explore and say, oh, all right, this is the director. Let's back up and say, ah, now we can write a test to do that. So now we can slowly extract. So you have a 
the possibility to to dive in and explore uh, and get to the answers you want. And then once you have those answers, you can say, ah, let's have some tests for that. And now we have other test cases for various edge cases. And oh, this information is nice. We'd like to have that visible in a view. And we'd like to see it in such and such a way so that we don't have to navigate anymore. So when you're doing all this navigation, that's painful. So the next time you just want to extract that as a method or a view or both. So it's it's really driven by the questions you ask, by the problems that you have. Okay, we'll continue. <laughs> we just uh, so, whenever you like. So. Uh, but uh, we we did that in the example, but we end up having that film class that the data uh, variable or instance variable slot that is coupled with a dictionary that represents how that data is read from or read from the IMDb and the mm. you know the keys it has. So that's I think that's basically the the problem we are seeing in the design of what we did. Uh, and we got to that design. That's because... entirely my blame. <laughs> okay. There's, okay. There's nothing specific about the the methodology that will lead mm. to that particular design. Oh, okay. It's just that when you have data, you wrap it. Now, if you have a uh, tree of data, you might yeah, you do make a convert or something that to convert that to the yeah. to an, to the uh, instance for class. You know, yeah. Yeah. usually you start with the simplest thing that works, and when you realize it's broken, like you realize it's somewhat. How do I get from the director to the director's films? Well, there's something wrong with their design, and you, if you've got your tests in place, you can then back up and say, okay, let's do it in a different way that every domain object knows knows the film collection and can query it and okay. some other kind of design. That's no problem. Okay, cool. I have a question, and maybe more an observation, or a question, I don't know, uh, from a, an educator point of view. Uh, for me, it seems that um, this, this way of writing the code is more like um, is more for expert uh, developer in oriented object programming. Um, I'm wondering if if someone new to programming uh, in oriented object, particularly, uh, if it would be a good fit uh, or not. Because so our, uh, our experience the, with that, yeah, because the way of writing the code is uh, exploited. Exploded. I mean, uh, you okay? You have a class, then you you browse the object. You, for me, it feels like you don't have the global view of the um, of the class you are building up. So, okay. so our experience was more the opposite: that newcomers, complete newcomers to programmers, it's like duck taking to water. They don't have any problems. What's more, a problem is that the people who have longer experience with more conventional kind of IDEs and ways of programming are resist and find it very very uncomfortable are very uncomfortable with the with some of the ideas we're presenting I, I think small talkers are a little bit more comfortable but even there it, I say it's that different. because uh, when you browse in the object there is a lot of uh, of assumption that what is oriented programming um, so yeah that's for me for us it's okay because we know behind the scene how it is it but for people that don't know, okay, we have a class, you have instance variable, you have a class method, you have instance method. They see the thing, but do they have the a global picture? Mm -hmm. I, th I think what the big advantage is, especially for newcomers, is when you, you want to think about the code and what it's actually producing. So you have the object right in front of you, and you can see what the effect is of your code. Because if you're in a conventional environment, you're just staring at code, and you're long distance away from the actual running things. And there's a, you have to bridge that gap in your mind. And it's only when you you can actually compile the code, and it will run, and you can see the result. And that that's a huge gap. Whereas if you have the object in front of you, say, oh, let's what happens if I do this? Ah, now I can see it immediately. That that's it's actually much more natural. I was always frustrated by the term object-oriented programming because it isn't. It's class-oriented programming. If you look at any object-oriented language in the development environment, what are you programming? You're programming classes. You're not programming objects, except in self. Uh, but uh, you, 
you program the classes and then you have to wait a while before you get the objects. In this approach, in the same environment, you're actually programming the objects. So for me, this is much more object-oriented. Uh, as a little anecdote, I had this experience with, um, uh, what was it? When I was writing slideshows, I was always here because every slide, oh, that's a page, that's a page inside this, but every slide that I had, like the this title slide here, uh, was a method and I could I could evaluate it and see it, but I was always moving back and forth in this long list of, of methods and I could never remember what the priorities were and it was, it was just painful. And then it suddenly hit me, said, wait, I should be doing this in a moldable way. So then I switched and I spent an afternoon or actually only an hour or two and I built up uh, a view so that I could inspect the live slideshow. And then I could see the slides, say, here's a slide and I could see the slideshow, and I could e extract the script that is potentially read, uh, and I could even see things like the um, some metrics, uh, estimated duration of when I'm talking. I could see the database of pages that are embedded inside the, and th and now I could incrementally develop the slideshow in a much more natural way. Uh, and it took me a while because I was still fixed on this idea of programming from the coder. When I switched to this, I suddenly became much more productive. It's, it's just uh, much more natural for lots of things. Uh, <laughs> but have you, you have to it. With your customer, have you done a peer, peer development with someone that has um, knowledge on the domain of the data, but no, no knowledge on, uh, on, on development? Mm -hmm. I mean, someone that has the expertise on the data uh, uh, you want to visualize, but have no experience at all in programming. Right, so I mean, you can work two ways. So if that person wants to learn how to program, then you have to mentor them. I was uh, uh, doing some uh, some experiments yesterday with a few people who were interested in, in that. And the other way is if that person is not interested in programming, then you kind of pair. So you have your domain expert and then the person who's programming and trying to build the model up, and they're asking questions and going back, back and forth. It's kind of what we're doing for this new custom of ours, uh, because we have the data, we're trying to build up the model, but there's some things we don't understand. So we go, there's a bit of back and forth when we have to ask questions. And they're not at the point where they're ready, they have enough time to pair with us uh, uh, on a, sitting next to us. So we can only ask questions now and then, but I think that'll improve later on. I'll still be here tomorrow and Friday, so if anybody wants to chat with me about anything else, I'd be happy to do so. I think we're getting close to the end of our energy and the time, so. Thank you.